Have you ever seen a pixie circle? I'm not sure if everywhere even has them, but I've definitely seen them all over the outback. Circles of bare soil, surrounded by grass that refuses to grow into the centre. And no one really knows why. We got a whole bunch of pixie circles, not all that far from the farm compound. Almost perfect circles of barren earth, bordered by thick grass, so close together they could almost resemble honeycomb. The field stretches for hundreds of metres in every direction, pockmarked and alien. When the Europeans came out, they brought their own myths of fairies and such with them, and so the name Pixie Circles was born. I've never really spoken to any of the indigenous folks about them, because they were always just basically a slightly weird grass formation. But I assume that they must have had their own mythology around them too. Of course, the truth is always stranger than fiction way out here. When I was very little, I used to play in the pixie circles. I was a bit of a rough lad growing up on the farm, but there was always space in my head for princesses and fairies and kings and all that stuff. The pixie circles were one of my favourite places from around the ages of 6 to 12. Because, you see, I was told the anglicised version of the reason for their existence and the idea of fairies appealed to my imaginative side. I used to run around in them, playing dress-up, imagining that I was a king and the circles were my kingdom. A few years ago, in my late teens, our property was almost directly under the shadow of a blood moon. For the older crowd like my dad, this was just a meaningless distraction that would prevent him from getting enough sleep to run the farm. But for me, it was really cool, and something that I didn't want to miss. Not to mention, I had my first serious girlfriend at the time, and we'd take any advantage to hang out. So, after dinner on the night of the eclipse, we threw an old mattress in the back of one of the utes, stocked up on snacks, coffee and a six pack of beer, and drove a short distance up the hill, behind the farmhouse, to get a better view. And some... privacy. We'd been up there for... three or four hours, when the eclipse began. The moon, slowly darkening, growing redder and redder. It was pretty spectacular, and with no light pollution to speak of, we had a great view of the show. As the moon got redder though, I started to notice another glow. Below us, on the other side of the hill, the field of pixie circles was beginning to glow a faint red as well. The light, it seemed to be coming from the soil in the circles. At first faint, but growing ever brighter as the red covering the moon got darker. I pointed it out to my girlfriend, just to make sure I wasn't losing my mind. And we divided our attention between the reddening moon in the glowing circles. As the eclipse reached its zenith, I noticed that the soil in the pixie circles was moving, which grabbed my attention pretty quickly. It shifted and cracked from beneath, and to our horror, creatures began clawing their way out of the dirt and shaking off the ochre dust clinging to their fur. They were tall and muscular, 
with long legs and backwards-facing knees, and arms that hung down well below their waists. Dark fur covered their bodies, apart from their heads, which were baboon-like and completely bald, while on their back formed a thick mane. Large, bulbous eyes gleamed red with their own internal luminescence. There must have been 20 or 30 of them. Once they'd all struggled clear of the soil, they seemed to shimmer. And suddenly, where they had stood, were tall, aboriginal men, wearing nothing but a loin cloth. As one, they turned in different directions and began walking away from the holes that they'd emerged out of. Several were heading in our direction, human in every way by the red glow emanating from their eyes. We freaked out. I got the distinct feeling that we did not want to encounter whatever these things were so we both bolted around to the cab of the ute and skidded down the hill towards the farm. Our flight was noted by Murray, one of the senior workers, who met us at the farmhouse door with a puzzled look on his face. His brow furrowed as we related what we saw. Get inside, young miss. We'll handle this. He trotted off to the quarters, presumably to gather some help. I half wanted to follow, to see what these things were. But I knew I probably couldn't do anything to help. We did, however, run upstairs and out onto the first floor balcony. I figured we'd be safe enough up there, and I might get a chance to sate my curiosity. Sadly, it was a bit anticlimactic. I saw a group of men storm off in the direction we'd come from, carrying bright torches. They vanished into the night, their light the only thing that suggested a location. Then came a commotion, loud shouts in the local indigenous dialect, punctuated by inhuman voices speaking the same language. Someone must have put fire to a few branches or something because suddenly there were flames licking at the night, waved back and forth. This went on for maybe half an hour before the men returned. Murray, making his way back to the main house, noticed me leaning over the balcony trying to see what was going on. He shook his head in amusement and beckoned me to come down. We call them Mamu, he explained downstairs. They live underground, or in hollow trees, until they wake. Mamu are very dangerous. You did the right thing getting out of there. They are vicious cannibals, if they catch you. But they are sneaky, and they don't like to fight hate fire also, and we have words to deal with them. They won't bother us again. With that, he rose and headed back to the quarters. He was always a man of few words, our Murray. I avoided the pixie circles for quite a while after that, but I think the blood moon was a major factor in raising the Mamu. We've seen eclipses since, and a handful of the local farmhands have always headed out to the pixie circles, putting up bonfires. I'm not sure if any more have woken up, but the guys generally won't talk about it, for fear of bringing bad luck on themselves. I will say, though, One night, I was in town, 
when a young Aboriginal man approached me just before I went into the pub. It's not unusual. Contrary to popular belief, most of the guys out here just want enough work to support themselves. And they know that the big farms are the best place to look. I was actually looking for a bit of help too, so I was ready to sit down with him and chat. But this kid... He didn't say a word to me. He just smiled. Really wide. It was kind of creepy. But he seemed harmless enough. And I figured maybe he'd just had a few too many. I slipped past him into the pub. It wasn't until I really thought about it. That I realised... His eyes had been glowing ever so faintly red.